numbers. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about what a complex number is, and we're going to talk about two different representations of complex numbers that are commonly used, called the Cartesian form and a polar or exponential form. A complex number is a number of the form a plus j times b, where j denotes the square root of negative 1. Now, if you have seen complex numbers in mathematics courses, you have probably used i to represent square root of negative 1, but it's fairly common in electrical engineering to use j to represent square root of negative 1. So if you have a complex number which is a plus j times b, then we say that a is the real part of z and sometimes written as re of z or real of z. And b is called the imaginary part of z. It's important to keep in mind that the imaginary part of z is not j times b, rather it is only b. If you are not careful about this, some of your calculations can go wrong. So when we write a complex number in this form as a real part plus j times an imaginary part, it is called as writing the complex number in Cartesian form. So this is called as the Cartesian form and it's named after the mathematician René Descartes. So it turns out that it's very useful to think of a complex number as a point in a two-dimensional plane called the complex plane. This is sometimes also called as an Argand diagram, again named after a mathematician. So in this diagram, the complex number z is represented by a point with coordinates a comma b. So the x coordinate represents the real part of the complex number and the y coordinate represents the imaginary part of the complex number. Now we can also think of the vector that connects the origin to this point and we can think of this complex number as also this vector. Now these representations turn out to be quite insightful and useful in dealing with complex numbers. So when we think of a complex number as a vector, this complex number can also be specified by the length of this vector, we'll call that as r, and the angle that this vector makes with the positive x-axis. So r and theta together specify the same complex number which, is, which can also be represented by a and b. Right? So when we do this, r which is the length of this, of this vector um, is also called as the magnitude of the complex number. And this is denoted by absolute value of z. Now this angle theta is called as the angle of z or sometimes called the face of z or the argument of z and this is sometimes denoted by the angle of z. Okay. Now we're going to measure angles where we measure positive angles counterclockwise. So the angle that this vector makes with the x-axis, if we measure the counterclockwise angle, then we say that these are positive angles. Now if we measure angle in the clockwise direction, then we say that these are negative angles. We'll talk more about this when we work out a couple of examples and things might get clear there. But the convention is to, to say that this direction is positive. And let's take a closer look at this. 
So if I have a complex number that lies on the x-axis, this complex number would correspond to, or the, the angle corresponding to this complex number would be zero degrees or zero radians. And then if I had a complex number somewhere here, that would be 45 degrees or pi over four radians. Now, mostly we write angles in radians. I, I'm just gi giving you the angle so that you know you kind of get familiarized with this. And maybe you have pi over three, which is 60 degrees, pi over two is 90. Then we have pi, which is 180. Um, so three pi over four, for example, here, five pi over four, three pi over two, seven pi over four, and two pi, which is the same as zero degrees. So clearly here we measured angles going counterclockwise. Now, if you did the same thing measuring this way, this vector, which was at an angle of seven pi over four, we can also think of this as being at an angle of negative pi over four. That's basically what I mean by saying we can measure angles clockwise, but there would be negative angles. And then three pi over two would be the same as negative pi over two, and you get the point. So this would be negative three pi over four, and pi would be the same as negative pi, negative pi over uh, uh, three over three pi over four would be the same as negative pi over four, so on and so forth. Okay. But we're going to use a convention and say that we're going to represent angles such that they are either between zero and pi or negative pi and and zero. So for example, this particular angle, we would prefer to use negative three pi over four instead of five pi over four. So we're gonna use a convention where theta is going to be between negative pi and positive pi. All right, now let's think about how we can convert complex numbers from the A comma B representation or the Cartesian form to the R comma theta representation. Okay, or in other words, given a R and theta, how can I find a, a and B? And given a, a and B, how can I find an R and theta? Now, to see that, let's think about this right triangle here, this right triangle. And notice that the length of the hypotenuse of this right triangle is given by R. And this angle is theta, which means that the length of this side is R times cosine theta, and the length of this side is R times sine theta. But we know that the x coordinate of this point is A, which means that R times cosine theta must be equal to A. And we know that the y coordinate of this point is b, which means r times sine theta must be equal to b. So what we have is that a can be obtained as r times cosine theta, and b can be obtained as r times sine theta. And now let's think about how we can get r and theta given a and b. Well, again, if you think about this right triangle here, R is simply the length of the hypotenuse where A and B are the length of the sides. So we know that R must be the square root of A squared plus B squared. Right, how about theta? Well, again, if you look at this triangle here, you see that tan theta is B over A. So what we have is that tan theta is B over A, and it's a bit tempting to immediately say that theta must be equal to tan inverse of B over A, and indeed that would be okay, but you have to be a little bit careful 
when you try to compute theta as the inverse tangent of b over a. And I'll talk about that in detail in the next video. But a quick um, explanation for what you have to be careful about is that if, if tan theta is b over a, then tan of theta plus or minus pi is also equal to b over a. So if you simply take the inverse tangent of b over a, you may get answers which are off from the correct answer either by pi in the positive direction or pi in the negative direction. And I will show you how to adjust for this in the next video. Um, but for now, what I want to uh, focus on is there are two ways to write this complex number, z. So we see that z is a plus j times b. And a can be written as, so z is a plus j times b, which can also be written as r times cosine theta plus j times r times sine theta, which we can write as r times cosine theta plus j sine theta. Now this form is called the Cartesian form. This form is typically called the trigonometric form. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about a very important formula called as Euler's formula, which tells us that this cosine theta plus j times sine theta can be thought of as r uh, as e to the j theta. So we can write z as r times e to the j theta, and this is called as the polar form or the exponential form. So typically in electrical engineering courses, it will be useful to be able to go from uh, back and forth between these representations. And um, I'll work out a few examples in the next video.